to all of you watching online and those of you in person, welcome to the Museum of Jewish Heritage. I'm Ari Goldstein, the museum's senior public programs producer, and it's an honor to kick off today's screening and discussion of A Question of Survival, a terrific new film from Bulgarian director Elka Nikolova. The film offers an essential perspective on the experience of Jews in Bulgaria and in the broader Balkan region during the Holocaust, a community that has uh, Sephardic origins and is often left out of the, the narratives we tell about the Holocaust and World War II. As we dive into that story today, we're joined by Elka, who we'll have a conversation with after the screening, and also by Chaim Zemach, uh, who you'll meet in the film, a wonderful cellist, Bulgarian and New Yorker, Welcome, Chaim. We're honored to have you here. We're also joined today by Bulgaria's permanent representative to the United Nations, Lachazara Stoeva. Welcome. Feel free to offer a few words now, and then uh, I'll kick off the film. Feel free to come up here. Thank you very much for the invitation. I feel really honored to be here, especially because I feel connected to the, f uh, the movie. Elka started... Um, uh, okay, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, I was saying I'm very honored and pleased to be here, and I feel especially connected to the movie. Um, Elka started um, working on this movie in 2009, and actually in January 2009, it is when I first met um, Mr. Chaim Zema um, in a completely unrelated event, but connected to the Remembrance Day of the Holocaust to the United Nations. Back then I was um, lucky to meet his wife as well, uh, who is now unfortunately not with us. And so uh, later on he told me that Elka was uh, making this film and throughout the years um, we've uh, talked on and off. And uh, in 2019 the mission organized um, Maybe for the first time, it showed uh, the trailer, a very um, that maybe not the trailer, but a bit of the movie, on an in, during an event organized at the United Nations on the day um, of the commemoration of the saving of the rescue of the Bulgarian Jews. Um, we are particularly proud uh, that uh, Bulgaria, it's a proud moment of our history, of course, it's not only black and white, and it has the personal storage uh, story of um, each and every one of them. And here we're going to um, hear three of the stories with the personal touch. So um, the story of the saving of the Bulgarian Jews is a difficult one to tell. Although the numbers sound really big, 48,000 people's lives were saved, um, as I argue, prevention is difficult to advertise because it's difficult to advertise the things that have not happened. So saving people from death is uh, Difficult to imagine, but it is a great achievement given the circumstances. So this film will help you understand better the stories. It will show different aspects of that story and the bigger picture and that part of history. So enjoy the film. It's going to be my first time when I see the whole film as well. And I'm happy to be here with you today. And hopefully we'll have many opportunities to see it screened and um, to popularize it in New York and not only. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador. And you're absolutely right. The, the film is essential not just because Bulgaria's story is so often untold when we talk about the Holocaust, but because it's a really stunning example of rescue. And there's a lot we can learn from it as we think about all the injustices in our world today. Alka, the film is really excellent. I'm struck by how well you tell a very complex story and not one that most viewers know. And also by the open and thoughtful reflections you really elicited from the, the men who are the stars of the film. Well done. Thank you. So we have about 30 minutes for a conversation. Uh, I'll ask Elka some questions and then we'll open it up for audience questions. So uh, please be thinking of questions you might have for Elka. Uh, we'll take questions from people in the room and also viewers online via the live chat on our YouTube live stream. Alka, I wanted to begin by asking you about Bulgaria's Jewish community before the war. All three of the men who star in the film are from Sephardic backgrounds, but they have different experiences. Uh, Misha spoke Ladino growing up, 
Chaim spoke Spanish and Robert spoke Bulgarian. Can you give us a, an outline of what Bulgaria's Jewish community was like before the war? Um, yes, uh, so the Bulgarian Jewish community was predominantly Sephardic. Uh, there were maybe very few Ashkenazi. Uh, so most, when I think was, when Haim says that he spoke Spanish, I think he meant probably that he spoke Ladino, which is the form of Spanish, which is the kind of the, the Spanish that the Sephardic Jews spoke. Um, because they came from, the, after they were expelled from Spain in 1492, they sort of um, spread to the Balkans and settled in, into then the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so they brought with them their language and that was the sort of the old Spanish, which is, um, as some of they say, it's the, the language of Cervantes, like that was kind of like preserved from that time. Um, so most of them spoke, I think the older generation spoke, the, the generation of the grandparents predominantly spoke Ladino, which is the, the form of Spanish. And so with every generation, um, the Bulgarian was being introduced because they were living in, in Bulgaria, they, uh, they were going to school in Bulgaria, so um, that is why when Haim said that he didn't want to speak, um, in a, which happens with every child, like I have a son who is growing up in America and he speaks English rather than Bulgarian. So, um, so I think that was kind of the, um, the situation pre-war. Um, so the, the older generation of the grandparents spoke Ladino, the next generation spoke Ladino and Bulgarian, and probably um, the younger generation, which were the kids, would speak uh, Bulgarian, understand Ladino. So that's how it was, I think. So often when we learn about the Holocaust, it, we can fall into the trap of envisioning Jews as sort of locked in time, like there were these ancient communities that the Holocaust then happened to, but there were real social upheavals happening across Europe and a lot of Jewish communities right before the war, and it's clear that that's happening in the Bulgarian community right, right beforehand. Now, you grew up in Bulgaria, but not in the Jewish community, is that right? Yes, yes, I am Bulgarian, I'm not Jewish myself, so. I wanna ask you about that in a minute, but yeah. uh, <laughs> we were not able to be joined today in person by the Bulgarian Consul General to New York, Maya Hristova, but she sent a very warm uh, letter of, of well wishes for the event, and I want to read part of her letter and then ask you about it. She said, Bulgaria is proud of the fact that 78 years ago, the Bulgarian people rose to the historic occasion and saved its Jews. This was an unprecedented act of civic courage when politicians, leaders of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, intellectuals, and ordinary citizens openly challenged and resisted the pro-Nazi government's anti-Semitic policies and successfully countered the deportation plans. It was a manifestation of the power of civil society and its striving to oppose a decision which contradicted the basic principles of humanity and civility. In the film, you touch on this moment of civic courage that the, that the Consul General describes. Can you explain for us exactly what happened? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, it is a very complex story. Um, the way the Bulgarian Jews actually survived, and it is to this day uh, sort of a, um, a very um, um, interesting, I mean, um, a story, because uh, Bulgaria was a um, partner, or uh, rather ally with Germany, and with that, they had um, committed, um, and agreed to to deport um, the Jewish population um, once they became allies. So um, Bulgaria also occupied uh, after um, uh, occupied some areas in northern Greece and Macedonia where some Jews lived there. And as part of that commitment, uh, actually they. Um, um, rounded up and deported 11,343 Jews to Treblinka. Actually, they handed it to the Germans and they um, 
they were deported there. So once that, the next step was to deport the Bulgarian Jews and the process was actually in place because they already had the, you know, followed through with everything um, the way it was, uh, that there was a special process of rounding up. And uh, so they um, started actually sending out the notices to, to the Bulgarian population as well when um, uh, there was some, the Bulgarian church uh, became involved that some politicians on, um, in parliament, um, the, prime, uh, the vice pre president of parliament, Dmitry Peshev, uh, wrote a letter to protest that and some uh, parliamentari parliamentarians signed it. So um, th there was some movement that actually um, to protect the Jewish population and to not to deport the Bulgarian Jews. And um, so it, it's a very complicated story, the way this actually happened. And I think it's, it's very difficult to comprehend um, and understand today, but actually um, the pressure that this, uh, th that was applied on the government actually uh, worked and uh, initially the deportation order was uh, rescinded for, for the first, but then, so there was this, this long process in which the government kept trying to, to deport the Jews and uh, steps were taken to actually protect them. So um, ultimately, uh, the Sofia Jews, it was decided that the Sofia Jews, which were the, the largest group of 25,000, were um, resettled to the provinces. And um, with time and the Russian army, you know, um, the Soviet army coming, the Red Army coming, um, that plan was abandoned. So it took a long time for this actually to, to happen, but ultimately um, the plan for deportation was, um, was abandoned and that's how the, the Bulgarian Jews uh, survived. It, it is a complicated story and it's <laughs> one that reminds us that reality is often more gray than the, the binary roles of a good person or a bad person and especially during the Holocaust. When you were growing up in Bulgaria, did you learn this story in school? Um, I actually do not remember talking about this in school, and I actually made the effort to look into my history books from school and to see how much time and how much space was allocated to that story, and it was basically like two paragraphs. So being a teenager or a young person, when something, a big story like this is introduced to you in three paragraphs, of course you will not remember anything. So, um, so it, is, it is fair to say, and I, at least for myself, and I don't know if any other Bulgarians had different experience, but I do not remember talking about this in detail and especially what happened to the Bulgarian Jews as well. So it was not a very well-known story. So you're not Jewish, and this wasn't a story that you grew up very connected to, but you ended up finding yourself spending the better part of a decade making this film. How did you get involved in the project? So um, I'm a filmmaker, and I was working on a, a, another documentary, uh, and I was doing research at the Museum of Modern Art, and at that, uh, then uh, a woman came and introduced herself to me and she said that she is a Jewish and she is from Bulgaria and she, uh, the woman, wa her name was Rosette Bakish and um, she told me how many wonderful memories she has of growing up in Bulgaria. I think she left when she was about 10, but she still had very, very vivid memories of her childhood. And um, she kind of told me about 
a little bit about her story, and then I started, um, because New York has a very large Jewish community, I became friends and uh, had a lot of Jewish friends by that time. So I, I was just curious to know what really had happened uh, with the Bulgarian Jews. And then um, I met uh, uh, Chaim Zemach through Rosette, and then um, I was introduced also to Misha Avramov, and I decided to interview them and to see if I can make anything a film eventually. There was just initially there were interviews that I wanted to just preserve their story. Um, so it came out of my curiosity and the need to know more and the, the fact that I didn't know anything about such an important story sort of um, made me really puzzled and I wanted to, you know, I, I want, simply wanted to know more about it. We should mention that we're delighted that Chaim is here. Misha is joining us in the live stream, and Robert passed away last year, so it's a, a blessing that his story is permanently memorialized in your film. Thank you. What was it like for you to conduct research, travel to Bulgaria, do the interviews as a non-Jewish filmmaker? Um, it, the, lear it, the learning curve was very steep, I have to admit to that. Um, it is a very vast and um, very complex subject, and um, uh, I, I have to say that I am really grateful that I started working on this project because I have learned so much. Um, and yeah, it was basically starting from scratch. I had to do a lot of research. I had to talk to a lot of people. There was a, a large learning curve, and maybe that's why it took me such a long time because I was really conscious about the fact how com in the beginning I think I started with sort of this presumption as every Bulgarian will be uh, and particularly at the time when I started it the the predominant sort of narrative was that the Bulgarian had saved its Jews but a little bit was talked about the other side of the story and so I was basically started with that kind of presumption that this is this amazing, just kind of almost happy end story. And then the more I was learning, and it was just the complexity of this, I just really did not want to do a sloppy job. I wanted to learn about it as much as I can and sort of to capture, if I can, because again, I think that this is a very extremely complex story to tell on film. Um, there are so many nuances and so many levels. It just did not happen in one single day. It just happened in the course of a very long time where this story was unfolding and it's very difficult to sort of for the person who doesn't know anything about this part of the world, about Bulgaria, about Sephardic Jews. These are all like very sort of um, different layers of unknown. Um, how do you tell a story like this to an audience who, let's say, let's assume that we don't know much about it. So that, that was a very difficult task for me. Um, and I tried my best. <laughs> I'll, I have one more question from you and then we'll turn to the audience. My colleague Sydney Yeager is gonna have a microphone, so raise your hand if you're in person and you'd like to ask a question and we'll also take some online. But just before we do, Elka, one of the central questions of the film relates to the term survivor. Uh, Chaim and Robert identified with the term survivor or felt that it was just based on its pure definition that it, it applied to them. Uh, Misha disagreed and, and said that he didn't want to claim a term that, that he didn't deserve. Where do you come out on the question of how and when to use survivor after wrestling with it in this film? Um, I tend to agree with um with Haim <laughs> on, on this because I think that um, I understand why Misha felt so uncomfortable claiming that uh, term um, because it is, uh, I think for, and for the three of them, when they came to the United States, sort of traveled from Bulgaria through Palestine, Israel, and they arrived in the United States, the predominant story was the story of the 
um, what happened in the concentration camps, and um, to so they were completely shocked to learn that and. And naturally, when they compared their personal story, what, what had happened to everybody else, they felt like, as Robert said, that I feel that this is my, I'm not an, that important of a survivor. But I think um, they also went through a lot of um, worry and a lot of uh, danger. And I think, especially for Robert, it was very difficult for him to talk about this. And I think that's where it, this idea not idea, but this, the theme almost about the survivor um, came from because I kept asking him questions like, what do you remember? He was kind of the older of the three and he just did not want to go there. He just did not want to talk about his experiences um, and tended to sort of remember only the, the good part of the story, but didn't want to really go into the, into the more uh, dramatic parts. So um, I think that this experience affected them very deeply because they were living in fear for a long time. <laughs> so even though they were not deported to the camps, they were living with the the fear and they were surrounded by people who were con but their parents who were constantly worrying about this and they felt it. Like, I know that every child feels the, the anxiety and the worry of their parents. So, um, so for that reason, I think that they were, they're definitely, for me, for me, the way I see them, uh, they're survivors of this. Because they really, um, it was, um, Misha, uh, Haim will disagree with me that they were lucky, but in, in certain sense they were. So, um, yeah, so I think, I think definitely survivors. I think I agree with you also. Uh, we interact with a lot of survivors here at the museum, and uh, some have specific terminology that they prefer. Like, some people say that they were hidden children and they, because they were hidden in a convent or in a family's attic, and so they feel that they didn't survive, but that term conveys something really precise. Mm -hmm. Um, one of our trustees, Dr. Ruth Westheimer, was in the kinder transport, so she says she's an orphan of the Holocaust, but not a survivor. But there isn't really a specific term that we can use for the Bulgarian experience. I definitely default to using survivor generously, or always defaulting to the preferred language of the person who has a lived experience. Mm -hmm. I think the Bulgarian experience was exactly what you said, the gray area of the, the complexity of what actually happened, because we would like to say that it's just a happy end story, but it's not. It's not only that. It has the tragic aspect of it, and it has the, also the, the, the fact that um, the Bulgarian Jews survived. But we are all looking at this story for how many, 75 years now? Um, it, it's it is difficult to understand what um, that situation was exactly, but you know, um, we, we can try to imagine, and because our life at the moment is kind of like, we, we can see how political, and I think it, we need to make a distinction between the, the policy of the government and the, act, the actions of the public and, it, and how important it is. And I think the, the lesson from this story is the importance of the engagement, like the public engagement on whatever level um, it is, that that can make a difference. I mean, it, it could have not made a difference in Bulgaria as well, but it did make a difference. And, and that's what I think is important to remember, that that sort of, um, that is the kind of the the uh, the lesson from this story that it's a very um, it's a very complicated story and it's not easy to tell. But uh, ultimately, it has all aspects of of that tragic part of our history. Thank you, Elka. Let's turn to the audience now to Sydney. 
Uh, please share your name and then the question into the microphone. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for making this fantastic film so important and it brought thank up you. so many aspects. It was so sensitive and the music and everything was beautiful. Uh, I was really confused about the several references to the public opinion. I'd like to know how that public opinion was expressed. Was it through newspaper articles or uh, expressions from the church? And what were all the sources of the public opinion? Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, I, I, um, I apologize for that. That was not clear enough. I wanted to I didn't want to overwhelm the, the audience with a lot of documents and um, I just tried to be uh, as sparse as possible because I wanted the political sort of, the, the historical events to be the frame for the personal experiences. But um, there were a lot of um, letters uh, and uh, that were written by um, leadership of the church to the king, to parliament there were uh, that one letter that was um also members of different let's say the lawyers uh, association uh doctors association writers association they were writing letters in protest of this initially of the law for the defense of the nation which was the one who limited the rights of the jews took their property they had to wear that all of the things that were done in any other place were done in Bulgaria as well. So there were a lot of protest letters, not in, in the newspapers, but you know, sent to um, sent to to Parliament, to the king. Um, the church had played a tremendous role in this because the, the leadership of the church in particular was very much involved in constantly talking to the the king and trying to um, plead the case that this is not, um, that, you know, the Jews need to be protected. So, um, yeah, so I, when we talk about public opinion, I would not use the term like the entire country, everybody, the, the, the nation, because these were sort of, I would say, a group of enlightened people who had the knowledge, who had the wisdom to understand uh, that this is, a moment in time that needed to be, um, they needed to do something about it. So in that sense, it was, yeah, in the form of letters and um, there were, you know, um, that, that. That was uh, from the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington, from the archive, yeah. I want to pivot from this to a question from an online audience member that's related, and then we'll go back to Sydney. Martha on the live stream is asking, how can she research more about her family who experienced the Holocaust in Bulgaria? And I would sort of pair that with what were the places that you went to when you researched this film? Uh, I would suggest that uh, the Bulgarian National Archive, uh, the Bulgarian State Archive, has a lot of documents pertaining to the um, the, the deportation lists, because lists were made for, you know, with everybody, and uh, it, it really depends what she's looking for, but the Bulgarian State Archi Archive is a very good place to start. Um, they have a, a wonderful specialist there. Her name is Ivanka Gezenko, who knows everything that it needs to be known about the, the Bulgarian archive, the, the Bulgarian mm -hmm. Jewish archive. So if anybody is looking to uh, find more information, that is the place to start because they have everything, uh, all the lists, you know, uh, telling you where your family was, let's say, resettled. Um, there is also information about the Greek and Macedonian Jews in there because that area was, uh, you know, under Bulgarian uh, administration, so all the archives from there are also in the, um, and I also believe that the Holocaust Museum in Washington made some um, f copies of this archive, so she can also try at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And I'm glad to see that we were able to help in a small way here at the museum, um, since we have Robert's yellow star in our collection. We saw a snapshot of that in the film. Sydney, back to you. Uh, okay. 
what happened is that Bulgaria in the First World War lost Trakia and Macedonia. And <coughs> Hitler said he would give it back to Bulgaria, costing 20,000 Jews. So when Bulgaria got the attack in Macedonia, they didn't give the citizenship, the Bulgarian citizenship. So 14,000 Jews from Tarka and Macedonia were taken to be killed. However, <coughs> because it was almost the end of the war, and uh, the king already uh, saw that <coughs> Germany lost to the Russians and so forth, so he could play with time, and that's how the Jews were saved. Yes, there was also opinion on the part of the uh, congressmen and uh, Stefan, uh, Metropolitan Stefan, who specifically talked with the king about the, the uh, deportation of the Jews. So much uh, in, in Plovdiv, there was, the Jews were sent to the train station early in the morning. And as they were going to be shipped, Metropolitan Stefan came and said, on my body, I will just lie on the train uh, rail and that, and beside that, <coughs> there was a letter from several congressmen, newspapermen, and there was a protest, so, uh, and they said that this is going to be a stain on Bulgaria for the, for, all, for the rest of the time. So that's how it really evolved. Thank you. I, for the sake of time, let's jump to one more uh, question from our in-person audience. I see one in the back. Um, Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I, sorry to take the floor again. I just wanted to give a little bit of context. First of all, it's a complex, uh, the, comp the reasons for why the Bulgarian Jews were saved are very complex. However, you need to keep in mind that the Jewish population in Bulgaria was held at very high regard. They were an extremely valuable part and very integrated into society. So the Bulgarian population in general wouldn't understand why this has to happen to them. And this is one of the very strong reasons they were extremely held in high regard, valued and great contributors to the Bulgarian society. And this is the case until today. It has been even to the communist regime. So uh, the Jewish population has always had a very important place in Bulgarian society. So this is one of the aspects that has to be looked at. And this is one of the, um, the aspects of the, in, and this gives you a bit of context why there was such an uprising fr coming from uh, the public, the so-called public opinion that also helped to, to prevent the um, deportation of the Bulgarian Jews. Another aspect that you need to have into consideration is the fact that Bulgaria joined, the, uh, uh, joined Germany um, reluctantly. So it was there, it was coming, it was close to the end of the war and the choices were either to join or to be completely destroyed. So the decision to join the uh, German ally, it will basically become part of the um, Nazi allies at that point, was not taken easily. It was a matter of survival. So it wasn't that we were so convinced of the righteousness of that war. It's just, you know, at some point you take decisions quite difficult. And um, basically, as the, the lady uh, just mentioned it wasn't easy it was they were stalling and stalling and stalling and there are many personal stories and some of them um, are real some of them are more uh, depicted in the stories after that um, the reason there is so little known is that during the communist regime not much was sto uh, spoken about that and i haven't studied that at school at all uh, when i was 12 years old when the regime changed and then it started coming up of course, for political reasons. So I just wanted to give you that context and to say that until that day, the Jewish population has a very important role in Bulgarian society. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Ambassador. Elke, do you have a response and any final thoughts for us? 
Um, I just, I'm really happy that the film is actually being shown at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, and um, I would like to continue our relationship because I wanted to tell you that I have a second part to this film, <clears throat> which is the story of, um, I just decided to separate it uh, because it was kind of a very different part of this very complex story. Um, I did find a family here in New York who has, uh, the father is from Greece and the mother is from Sofia, Bulgaria, G drama Greece. And um, within their personal story, there is all the complexity of, of what happened in Bulgaria, in, in Northern Greece. Uh, so um, I'm really happy that the film is being shown here because I think this is the place for, w I hope that it finds its place within the, the, the collection of the museum that, that more attention is paid to the Holocaust in the Balkans uh, Bulgaria is just one part of it. it. It has so many, and and also because there were small Sephardic communities in the Balkans, and when the Jews were deported, almost like 80, in some cases 90 percent of these communities perished. So there are not many people left to advocate for them, and so. I would like, and I'm, and the fact that the Bulgarian population survived is an amazing story, but there is also like um, the rest of the the area, and and I am really hopeful that, you know, um, in the future more attention will be paid to to that part of, and also to that part of the Holocaust history and also the Sephardic Jews in particular. So um, with that, I wanted to thank you so much for, for coming tonight. It is very exciting to actually have a chance to be in a real theater, not just online. So um, this was an amazing uh, experience. Thank you so much. Alka, it's a privilege for us to learn from you. Thank you for being here and for helping us screen your film, A Question of Survival. Thank you to Bulgaria's permanent ambassador to the United Nations for joining us and to the Bulgarian Consul General in New York for her warm wishes. And a special thank you to Chaim for being here in person and Misha online. Everything that we do at the Museum of Jewish Heritage to preserve the history and lessons of the Holocaust is made possible through donor support. So a big thank you to those of you here who help make our work possible. And if you don't, we encourage you to make a donation or explore opportunities to join the museum as a member at the front desk or on our website as you leave. Thank you all. Have a good evening. <laughs>